In this video, I want to introduce a framework that I've been using more and more in the classroom as a tool of understanding a lot of things really, but primarily as a tool of understanding how do we start to get to the bottom or the root of the social problems that we see today. What I see a, a lot of is, is a lot of us, I think, feeling overwhelmed to the point of inaction almost. Like it feels almost impossible to gain a bigger picture understanding and, and all the issues that we're seeing seem so separate and tangled together that it can be debilitating. It seems almost easier to kind of stay stuck in our zone and perhaps like not even try to make the impact that we would hope to see in society when it feels quite this, this big and cumbersome and scary. When I myself find, find that I'm feeling those kind of ways, when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the world, when I'm feeling like social problems are um, too large to untangle, when I'm feeling that what what sort of impact can I as an individual human in this world possibly make? These problems are so big, they've existed for so long. One thing that I find helpful is to turn to nature. Nature is the stability underneath the world <laughs> in which us humans operate. So for this framework to, to think about some of these issues in a way that can start to help them feel more tangible and therefore a little bit easier to address, I want to turn to the metaphor of trees, as perhaps you are imagining. So if I if I hadn't shown you this image, if I said just think of a tree, like imagine a tree in your mind's eye, probably what you are envisioning is like the very top part of the tree. So probably what you're envisioning is if my arm is a tree, um, you're probably envisioning the branches, the trunk, the leaves, etc. All of those are, of course, like when we look out into the world, that's the that's the most prominent part of a tree that I see. And of course, what we also know is like that's not the entirety of the tree. In fact, the root structure of trees is much more significant, much more important to the structure of the tree itself than the branches and the trunk even are. So if we think of how a tree develops, um, we know that they don't just suddenly appear. We don't just suddenly look out our window one day and like there's the, the trunk and the branches, the, the part that we think is the tree. We know that it starts somewhere else. We know that a tree starts from a seed. The seed starts in the ground. The seed starts in a place of um, receiving nutrients, receiving structure from whatever sort of environment that it's in. What the soil is like, what's the water like, is it near a water source, etc. So the tree starts under the surface, tree slowly starts to develop roots, and then that's what gives the tree its structure needed in order to emerge from beyond the ground. And that's how trees grow, right? So they develop their roots, poke out of the ground, and then that's what gives them the strength. They hold on with their roots into the ground. That's what gives them the strength to grow upwards and turn into the thing that we all now see and automatically associate with. There's a tree. So social problems are very similar. None of the stuff when we look around in society today and, and see all these scary bad things happening, none of this stuff suddenly popped up overnight, right? Like it all started somewhere, much like a tree, starts in some sort of environment, starts kind of underground without people even realizing what's happening. The seeds are planted, they start to grow roots, the, the tree, the problem starts to take form, and then if that problem continues to be supported in, in growing, then we eventually end up with the big picture social problems that we see today. So I'm proposing this tree framework as a way of better understanding social problems. If we start to think about the sort of like developmental lifespan of a social problem, how it came to be, where it came from, how it's being supported, how it has been supported throughout history, throughout time, it can help us understand a whole lot more about why are we continuing to see the same thing happening again and again and again? Because here's the here's the hard truth of, of the society that we're living in today. If we as a society continue to do the same things in the same ways that we're doing them now, we'll continue to get the same society we see around us. And when we look around us, this is not the world we want to create. There are a lot of, of problems that are happening that have been around for decades, for centuries even, that, are, that don't seem to be going away. If we keep trying to address those problems the same ways that we have, we'll keep getting the same problems in the same way that we have them now. If we keep doing the same thing, we'll keep getting the same results. Part of this happens because we live in a society that is very focused on immediate gratification, very focused on quick fixes. 
when we look around as a society and see like, oh, here's all these branches, here's this tree, our first instinct, our first thought might be like, oh gosh, okay, we got to go cut down this tree. We got to go cut down these branches. So we kind of rush into solving problems in a way um, that doesn't always lend us the time and energy and understanding needed to even know like, what is the problem here? So one example would be um, unemployment. So we know finding access to employment is an issue a lot of people face. I worked for a couple of nonprofit organizations that offered various types of like job skills training programs, resume preparation, interview skills, et cetera. If we are to envision this as a social problem tree, if we are to envision this in this kind of tree framework, the main sort of symptoms of the problem, what I would call the symptoms of the problem are the things that we see up here in the branches. So if we're thinking of unemployment, like what are the obvious things that we can look at and, and say like, okay, that's a problem. Like a person needs a resume, a person needs job skills, a person needs interview clothes. So we see this like lack of them having a job as, as an immediate need that needs to be met. We have to find out how to get them a job. We have to get them clothes. We have to get them skills, etc. Now, if we stop and think for a minute, why does somebody not have a job? Like think to yourself, what are some reasons that people are unemployed in this country? Why can't people find employment? So now we're thinking a little bit deeper in the tree. Maybe we're thinking about things like access to education. Maybe we're thinking about things like intergenerational poverty. If this family has been living in poverty for generations, then it's not quite as simple as like, let me put some clothes on you and send you into an interview. What we're tackling is going to be quite a bit larger than that. We may also think of things like discrimination. What we know about access to employment is that, of course, employers are like anyone else in the world. We're all affected by our unconscious biases. So we know people of color are less, less likely to get positions of employment. Sometimes that comes down to names. Sometimes that comes down to appearance. We know even physical attractiveness can be a determinant in who's going to get a, a position of employment or not. So when we're looking at the issue of unemployment a little deeper, we're seeing some of the reasons behind why somebody on a surface level is not finding employment. Maybe the clothes are an issue, maybe the resume is an issue, maybe some of those skills are an issue. However, if we look deeper, we can see that there's some deeper roots here. So what that calls on us to do is to think a little bit more critically about the problems we're trying to accomplish. And if I'm somebody who's trying to design a program to address unemployment, maybe I don't go jobs training skills. Maybe that's not really the problem here. Maybe instead I need some anti-bias training for employers. Maybe instead I need some sort of intervention to take a look at poverty um, or generational trauma and how that affects people's ability to find and, and maintain positions of employment. Like I know my previous experience working for an organization that was, was actually creating a jobs training program while I was there, within a year they decided to cancel the program because it, it turned out it wasn't really sustainably helping people get employed. You know, we saw a few people get hired, but those people weren't actually able to stay within their positions of employment for a long-term basis because of some of the things that I've mentioned, because chronic poverty prevented them from transportation access to get to and from their place of employment every day, because intergenerational trauma had created circumstances in which it was really hard for them to, to work with a boss who had no understanding of what trauma does to people's brains and bodies. A lot of what we see, especially I would say in the nonprofit community, especially in, in the social work realm, um, we see lots of interventions that have, have really positive intentions and yes, like can help in some ways. And yet I would argue that the reason that we continue to see the same social problems again and again and again, the reason we continue to see history repeat itself again and again and again is because we as a society stay wrapped up in these kind of superficial level versions of the problem as opposed to unpacking and understanding, now where is this really coming from? So thinking of social problems in this, in this sort of way on an individual level or on a societal level can give us some additional tools in figuring out how do we sustainably address these things. And to me, this is what a macro social work perspective is all about. It's about let's gain a, a critical, deeper understanding of problems so we're not just sort of pick, pulling at straws and, and hoping that something sticks. Let's talk about race-based health disparities. 
so I chose this topic because I, I think it lends itself well to this example. Um, this is also something that's kind of a particular passion of mine. I took a um, PhD level course on health inequalities and it sort of blew my mind and, and changed the way that I, as, as someone educated in this in this sort of helping profession, um, it changed the way that I viewed health. It changed the way that I viewed um, trauma. It changed the way that I viewed oppression. It also changed the way I viewed statistics. So I'm pulling from some of that content in this little presentation here. My ultimate question is, um, well, in part, I mean, our main mission, of course, is to 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 take a look at what's happening in society right now. Like, what are some of the upper level top parts of the tree, the things that we can point to and very clearly say like, oh, here's a problem that needs solving, but then how do we unpack it deeper? So of course, that's one of our, our primary missions. Our second mission is to think about if all of these things are social constructs. So if, if race is a social construct, then why are there disparities surrounding health outcomes? So social construct essentially means that this is something that has been created by society. This is not something that is innate to the human experience. This heading from the National Geographic article says it in a nutshell. There's no scientific basis for race. It's a made up label, meaning that the, the way society has built itself around race is very real. So people's experiences in the world based on their race are very real and very difficult. We're going to, we're going to go into some of that now. And it's not a biological concept. So it's not when scientists look at the biological differences between people, the the color of our skin is, is not something that has an influence on our personality, on our intelligence, etc. So this is what it means to be socially constructed. It's something that if we had a utopian island, raise children there free of the free of the biases, free of, of the prejudice that we see in today's society, free of the social conditioning, there would be no difference based on race. We're going to start at the top of the tree. I kind of have three categories that I'm going to talk about up here on the top of the tree, taking a look at essentially what the birth process is like, what the life experience is like, and then what the death process is like, or, or the three health indicators we're going to look at that um, I'm going to say are, are kind of at the top of our tree. So they're, they're the most obvious things we can point to and say, yes, differential health status is an issue. Um, there's something going on with race and health. A few statistics to throw at you. First is this one that's closest to me that's looking at moderately low birth rate and very low birth rate. So moderately low birth rate is that blue colored bar. Very low birth rate is that black colored bar at the bottom. And we can see that this is divided by non-Hispanic black folks, Hispanic folks, and non-Hispanic white folks. The definitions and categories of race that I'll be sharing in this in the statistics portion are... are if race is a social construct, it's really, of course, difficult to create categories to sort of sort people within. Definitely imperfect. Um, so take all these statistics with kind of a grain of salt. However, what we can see from this chart very clearly is that black and brown folks are, are more likely to, to have children, to give birth to children who are at a lower birth rate, which of course is not good for babies. We can also see that this next chart is showing infant deaths per 1,000 live births. So it's showing the rate of infant deaths between 1999 and 2013. So we can see as a whole, everything is like slightly getting better. And again, we can see that black folks and indigenous folks, native folks, um, certainly quite high on that rate. So we can see here, here's some stuff going on with health. Both of these statistics, I think all of these statistics in the top of the tree are from the CDC. All right, so these next charts, look first to the charts right above me. Um, so we can see obesity rates, diabetes rates, hypertension rates. So hypertension relates to high blood pressure. High blood pressure is a, a health indicator that's connected to our hearts. I mean, it's connected to everything really, but primarily it's a measure used to assess like heart health. So look at the bars that are the tallest. We can see again, Hispanic and black folks, higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of hypertension. Here's another little illustration of hypertension for 20 and older, broken down by men and women. Still, we see those differential rates. Over here, we have asthma rates. So we can see the highest bars in all three categories, 
Black folks, Puerto Rican folks, more likely to have asthma in 2017. This is from the CDC as well. And this final chart, taking another look at obesity for children. Again, similar results. We can see obesity, more of a risk factor for Hispanic and Black folks. Now when we come to death rates, a bit more of the same. So this is the average age at death. We can see white folks in the darkest blue bar have the highest average age at their death, somewhere between 70 and 80. See black and Hispanic folks have around 60 to 70. Homicide rates. So white folks are this dotted line across the bottom here. The full line without any dots in it, the solid line is the overall average. Can we see black and Hispanic folks more likely to be a victim of a homicide? Death rates related to diabetes for 65 and older. White folks this time are this dotted line down here at the very bottom, black and brown folks at the top. So lots of reason for concern, right? Lots of reason for concern. Lots of reason to point to this tree, think, yes, there's something going on here. Similar findings for heart disease, although here white folks are a little bit higher up on the chart. Okay, so if I was a medical professional who was interested in intervening in health, probably I would be targeting thinking of those branches up top. However, again, we're going to unpack this a little deeper. We're going to do some additional thinking about if we really wanted to intervene in health disparities, what should we do? So I'm um, taking us back to the European Crusades. Of course, much of my inspiration for this came from an indigenous people's history of the United States. I have a little quote up here from Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz about this time period. So started roughly 1095, lasted to roughly 1291. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz here says that during this time period, Europeans conducted the Crusades to conquer North Africa and the Middle East, leading to unprecedented wealth in the hands of a few. This profit-based religion was a deadly element that brought that European merchants and settlers brought to the Americas. So I'm taking us back to this time period, looking at the United States specifically, because the European Crusades shaped quite a bit of the formation of the United States back in this time period and ongoing. We're going to see how this kind of builds up through our roots and into our tree. But a couple things we can see already happening here is wealth distribution. So wealth distribution in the United States started back during this time period of the European Crusades because this was when Europeans were beginning to accumulate and hoard wealth, which of course, as we know in society today, in order to get any kind of, of health-related treatment, we're going to need money. Wealth is especially helpful in that. The other point that I want to talk about is that this, this incident in 1095 is a, a pretty critical moment in the shaping of racism as we know it today. So in 1095, this, this speech was given, the Pope gave this sort of um, blessing to, to people in this time period that was in, in part rooted in religion and in part rooted in race. So if you go in and you take a look at the, the full speech, you can see that there was some dehumanizing rhetoric that was used about the race of the people that they were taking, that they were seeking to take this land from. So it was in part this, this God wills it, um, God has predestined you Europeans to, to have this land, therefore you can take it at any cost. You can take lives, you can steal land, you can steal resources. There was this sort of, of blessing given for violence committed. And during this speech, the Pope also uses terms about the Turkish people, the Muslim people being an accursed race, makes mention to their, their race as, as part of what makes them non-deserving of this land. So this was a pretty critical moment in history in which we saw a, an initial sort of rallying surrounding religion, surrounding the taking and, and accumulation and the hoarding of resources, all under the guise of um, you people, you white Christians, you are deserving of this property. This other race over here is not deserving of this property. Therefore, you can take it from them. 
Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz really points to this moment in time as as foundational in the spreading of the European Crusades, and the spreading of the European Crusades is ultimately what led to the colonization of the United States. So if we follow this route up a little bit further, flash forward a couple hundred centuries, in terms of, of white supremacy as we know it in the United States, the previous slide, this, this speech that was given that rallied and, and sort of uh, gave birth to the, the European Crusades was really the, the seed of white supremacy that then continued to spread for, for centuries and, and still continues to this day. I want to point to a couple books that were published in the early days of the United States, in the early centuries of the United States, um, that really sort of paved a pathway moving forward in terms of how race was socially constructed in our country. The books I want to focus on are Crania Americana by Samuel George Morton. And then I also want to focus on a couple books by Charles Darwin. So social Darwinism, if you're familiar with it, has been helpful in understanding evolutionary processes and has also been a weapon of white supremacy since the publication of these books. First was Samuel Morton. So Samuel George Morton was a doctor, as it says here. He was interested in understanding sort of brain science, but more so his research focused on looking at the size of skulls. And, and what he really did was he compared the size of skulls across races. He focused on, I think, like four or five different races that he knew of at the time. He put forth a scientific theory based on this that because his measurements showed that white people had larger skulls, that therefore they were the more intellectual human beings. And this was then used to justify things like genocide, slavery, etc. We've seen science used to justify a whole lot of horrendous stuff in, in our history and in our current times as well. A couple things to mention, if I was doing a social problem tree of of how skull size develops. Um, trauma and nutrition are, are hugely influential in, in how big our skulls and how big our brains grow. So really his study should have been more a measure of, of the environment than of the individual person. I wanna show you some quotes from this book about how he categorized people. So he talked about the Caucasian race being distinguished with the highest intellectual endowments. This last sentence I think is telling. Essentially this race has peopled the finest portions of the earth and given birth to its fairest inhabitants. Black folks talks a little bit different. Again, this, this book was in large part used to justify slavery. This line in particular speaks to me of that. Once overcome, they yield to their destiny and accommodate themselves with amazing facility to every change of circumstance. Here's how he categorized indigenous populations, essentially as restless, revengeful, fond of war, crafty, ungrateful, unfeeling painting them as a, a violent race, as a race that is uninterested and unable to learn in terms of the justification of genocide against indigenous folks. This line certainly speaks to that. This next quote is from um, Charles Darwin's book. His book is officially called On the Origin of Species. However, the subtext of that is, quote, or the preservation of the favored races in the struggle for life. His book was really about animals, um, so there's some like historical discussion back and forth about was Charles Darwin's intent for his work to be used in some of the ways that it has been used, um, and yet when I point out a quote like this, we can kind of understand some of the context through which his book was used for nefarious purposes. In particular, this last line, he speaks of this one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings namely, multiply, vary, let the strongest live, let the weakest die. Again, this was used and, and wrapped into a justification of atrocities committed against other populations. Welp, they just were born to die. They were born to be in this situation. We were born to be superior. What can we do about it? We're just following through with what nature says. This quote is from a follow-up book he wrote, The Descent of Man. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Again, his arguments um, were applied in this, this same sort of tone. They were combined with this 
theory of eugenics that had been developed, um, implying that there was some sort of biological difference based on race that influenced our intellectual abilities, that influenced our personality in terms of whether we were more geared towards war or peace. And then it was built upon through Charles Darwin's work in the 1800s to sort of broaden this. In fact, laissez-faire capitalism, you may have heard of laissez-faire capitalism, is, is sort of an application of Darwin's theory to the notion of capitalism. That, well, if, if people aren't working hard enough, then they'll just die off, and that's natural selection, and that's the way that nature works. Now, looking back with the benefit of increased awareness of institutionalized white supremacy, we can, we can understand that that is not the case at all. However, in this time period, it, it was these, these books, these theories were used in building policies, in building institutions, in developing a lot of the foundations that our country now stands upon. Which leads us into settler colonization. So settler colonization of the Americas, of course, went hand in hand with all of this. This is something that originated in the 1940s. And I put ongoing and I included this image. Settler colonialism is a structure, not an event, because if we look around in today's society, we can see that we are still colonized. One thing I think is... Uh, important and, and something that we don't always do often enough is like a zoomed out look at history. For example, this American slavery versus segregation versus where we're at now as a society image kind of makes a powerful point about just how much history we in this country have to overcome. You know, we had over 300 years of legalized slavery. After that, we had almost 100 of legalized segregation. We still have segregation in our cities. When we talk about social problems that are related to race, we have got to look at this history because history is what shapes the current world around us. So the amount of time that our society has spent beyond the sort of like socialized, normed, accepted acceptance of slavery is, is so minute in comparison to how long our, our population in this country spent um, living and breathing slavery. In addition, we can see that this image that I'm on top of right now is um, Indian land cessation. So this is looking at throughout history, what were some of the patterns that occurred with land being taken from indigenous populations? So of course, at, at one point in time, this whole map was indigenous land. There was no white space. So even like the, the top corner up here is a, a, a little bit of a misrepresentation of how this land once was. But if we can see that things have, have really gotten pretty bad in terms of how indigenous people are pushed and, and congregated into very small pockets of um, rather undesirable places, pieces of property in this country. And, and irregardless, even though we can point to this other chart over here and say, well, slavery has ended, legal segregation has ended, the amount of time that people spent living in those conditions, of course, impacts the health outcomes that we're seeing now. Of course, impacts every outcome that we're seeing now, because we spent almost 400 years, we spent over 400 years living in that environment. Um, those are some really deep roots. And when we look around today as a society and, and see similar problems, similar patterns, um, this gives us an indication as to why. So if we go up a little further, I wanted to include capitalism in this as well in terms of some of the wealth distribution issues mentioned before. So this is a book by Thomas McGraw, a professor for Harvard Business School. So he wrote this book on how modern capitalism was created. What was really interesting to me that I did not know until reading this article was that capitalism and settler colonization happened at the same time. In fact, um, when some of the first ships, when the first ship came from Europe and, and entered the what, now, what is now known as the United States, what was then the Americas, it was sponsored by a private organization, what we would call a private organization. It was sponsored by an organization back in Europe. So capitalism founded colonization in this country. Capitalism, I mean, it's, it's built into the title. When you hear the word capitalism, what does it imply that that is prioritizing? Capital, money. 
So capitalism, of course, is an economic system. However, when we have a country that's been built upon an economic system like this, what that means is that we are constantly in a position of prioritizing capital. And, and that means that we often have to sacrifice the human. So when we think about the healthcare industry today, when we think about access to um, services, capitalism hugely interplays with that because we have established these systems that depend on capital, depend on money to keep going, which quite often results in us not being able to help people, not being able to help people fully. Um, sometimes it results in us harming people as well. Okay, if we can move up the tree just a little bit. So we're sort of now at the stage of the trunk where we're seeing what are the, what are the things that are continuing to support this tree's growth? Like how do we see this continuing to play out? It's got a little watering can. It's kind of like the, the elemental support that has allowed those roots that we just reviewed to blossom into, to turn into the social problems at the top of our tree, the health disparities at the top of our tree. So a couple of things I wanna focus on, unconscious bias, all of us are socialized in this country to view social constructions as real, right? Like this is what social constructionism is. Um, we are all socialized in this country to view race as a thing. And of course, we know now that we've looked down to the roots. This is something that started before the dawn of this country. This has been ongoing for a long period of time. I included a few images. We see, first of all, The Birth of a Nation. That's closest to me, that little tiny image. The Birth of a Nation is a film that's talked about in the documentary 13th as kind of being hugely influential at the time of film, kind of one of the first examples of how media was used, how film was used to uh, perpetuate a social bias. So The Birth of a Nation portrays Black folks as evil, as scary, um, as rapists, etc. We also see on, on the other side, the image with the skulls. This is not the work of the author we were looking at previously, but it's, it's very similar in that historically for a long period of time, black folks, people who were enslaved were compared to gorillas, were compared to animals as a method of dehumanizing them to the point that society could accept um, the atrocities that were being committed against them with slavery. So this was what science was used for, as we previously talked about. And this is something that still happens today. The Vogue cover is something that came out, you know, not that long ago. But wow, when it's paired next to that image of the, what is that? The gorilla guy. I'm blanking on his name. But when it's put next to that image, we can see kind of how stark that example is. And, and I think Vogue's intention was to kind of like make a play on this image. Unfortunately, they didn't take into consideration what the implications of that would be. So I include these as examples, um, sort of extreme examples, but I would, I would suggest to you, like, think about the ways in which you have been socialized to view race. Did you watch the show Cops growing up? Do you watch the local news now? How are Black people portrayed? When Black Lives Matter was taking off, how did the news portray Black people who were involved in um, protests and rallies for that? When we think of these faces down here, so we have Trayvon Martin, we have Tamir Rice, we have Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a, a young boy, um, 12, 13, around that age, who back in the whew, 50s, 60s, this is a bit of time ago, was accused of wolf whistling at a white woman. So a, a grown white woman accused him of, of wolf whistling, like, <laughs> at her and he ended up being lynched in that time period. So there's some pretty horrific photos online of, of how brutalized his body was. Just a couple years ago now, that white woman, she confessed that she had made the whole thing up. So this is an example of, of somebody who um, paid the consequence for the ways that black people had been portrayed because it was so easy for society at that time to believe that this young boy was evil, was a monster, was something to the point that, that would justify what happened to him. Similar with Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin is a, a kid in a hoodie who was walking from the store to, with candy, um, something kids do all the time. And he was perceived as this dangerous person. Same thing with Tamir Rice, that he's 12. He was playing with a toy gun in a park, as lots of 12-year-olds do. I have neighbors across the street who, who play like that all the time. Police officers arrived and within two seconds of seeing him, shot him and killed him. 
So we have this continued perception of Black people as dangerous, especially Black boys as, as being grown, as being monsters, as being older than they actually are. We have been socialized to remove and detach humanity, remove and detach um, viewing this as a, as a person, as a child, and instead all people see is a socially constructed version of race that has been programmed into our collective psyche for, for decades, for centuries. So unconscious bias, um, a huge way that these patterns continue to replicate. So the other way, systemic inequity, of course, this is like the actual institutionalized oppression, how we see these things playing out in our systems and structures today. We see this playing out in education. We see this playing out in income status. We see this playing out in wealth distribution. One thing I'll point out to you quickly is, is this image right here. So this is looking at um, white folks versus black folks between 1963 and 2016, looking at the wealth gap between them. So you can see that in 1983, white families held five times more wealth. In 2016, it was seven times. So we're not seeing these get better. Um, in some ways, we're seeing them get worse. These images are looking at healthcare coverage, sort of mentioned that already, um, out of school suspensions, people of color much more likely to have that sort of expectation of them to, to be these grown ups, to be these bad people. We see that playing out in elementary school even. This image down here at the bottom, average likelihood of imprisonments, um, one in three black men as opposed to one in 17 white men, as opposed to one in 111 white women likely to be imprisoned in their lifetime. So we see a lot of this play out in our institutions. How does this connect to health disparities? So we've looked at the roots, we've looked at some of the supporting factors of those roots, how those roots were allowed to grow, how they still continue to turn into this tree today. Now, how do we get to the branches? How do those health disparities actually happen? This is a huge part of what my class taught me about chronic stress. So a couple things. I wanted to include this quote from Tanahisi Coates, who is a, an author, a current author. So he said, but all of our phrasing serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, crack bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. And this is really what this portion is, is all about. This is really how those health disparities emerge because toxic stress is a direct outcome of chronic oppression and racism and the unconscious bias that we were talking about previously. So if I am a black man and every day in the world I encounter some sort of racist scenario where I can tell someone's afraid of me without reason, maybe somebody says something blatantly to me, maybe somebody calls me a name, maybe I don't get hired for a job, maybe I get fired from a job, all of this affects my health. So what we're now learning with this increase in, in kind of trauma-informed care as a nation is how interconnected our experiences in the world are with the way that our body physiologically functions. So when we saw all those previous rates of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, all of those are connected to how our body is processing. And if I am in a state of chronic stress because of oppression, because of trauma, because of poverty, my, my body reacts, my body stays in an activated state, my blood pressure is chronically high, therefore resulting in health issues, heart issues, etc. So a couple things I just wanted to highlight, I included them here in case you are interested. These are a few articles that I read for that class that I mentioned. This is an example of a macro perspective understanding of how racial disparities in health actually play out. So rather than looking at individual health issues, very often when we see those issues at the top of the tree, uh, it calls on us to ask questions like, well, what are they eating and what are they buying in terms of food and are they getting enough exercise and like what choices are they making on an individual level? 
this article helps us understand that while we see these things play out on an individual level, what's really happening is societal. It's, it's societal and the society, I mean, it's sort of like the social model of disability rather than blaming the individual for being in that circumstance. We need to look at how society is structured in a way that is creating this common experience for so many people. We know about brain science, links to socioeconomic status, health and disease, um, how our brain is impacted by the stressful experiences that we go through. It activates our emotions. It causes a chronic state of fear and anxiety, affects our memory, affects our ability to learn in school, affects our decision-making properties, puts us in a constant state of panic. There's studies looking at this within children and young people as well. Aging and cumulative inequality. How does inequality get under the skin? We now know that it's something that sticks with us. The Body Keeps the Score is a fantastic book that, that really changed my understanding of a lot of these things as well in terms of how trauma lives in our body. So all of this is then how we end up with the health conditions that we see today. These are not individual choices that are causing these health issues. There's nothing special about race that causes one race of people to be better, more superior, healthier than the next. This is a condition that's been created by society. So when we zoom out, take a holistic look at our tree, walking it through, going through this sort of activity helps us get to a point where we can start to identify other ways of intervening. So if we think about right now, how are medical fields attempting to intervene in health issues? We see lots of targeting at the top. We see lots of focus on individual behavior. We see lots of focus on diet, on exercise. My goodness, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about their experiences going into the doctor for some health condition and being told the answer is that you need to lose weight. That is not the problem. Correlation does not equal causation. If you're a statistics person, that will make sense to you. What is the problem is that deeper things are happening. People have unaddressed trauma. People have unaddressed toxic stress due to oppression. And that is what we're not healing as a society. So breaking down a problem in this sort of way gets us out of staying stuck in the branches. Because the thing is, if, if we have a tree that's sick, taking down one branch is not going to change that, right? Even if we took down a couple branches, not going to change that. Even if we cut off the top of the tree, not going to change that. The same thing is true when we talk about this issue. Until we as a society get to some of this deeper stuff down here, we're gonna to continue to see the same problems replicating because we're seeing those same processes playing out in society today. So all of this, it gives us additional avenues of intervention. Instead of focusing on individual behavior and how do I teach individual people to be as healthy as they can in the situation they're at, which of course is important. Like, of course we also need that. And yet if we stay there, if we don't go deeper, we'll never see the sustainable change that we want to see. We're always, we'll always stay stuck in that reactiveness of trying to, to teach individual people how to change this problem. Instead, we can start to look deeper. We can start to think about how do we address subconscious bias so that people of color don't have those experiences that are creating toxic stress for them every single day? How do we change our policies and systems so that the inequality that has been established from the start in terms of wealth distribution, in terms of um, some of the underpinnings of capitalism, how do we change that so we all have access to the same life opportunities and therefore prevent some of these health conditions from playing out. So I hope this has helped you to think a little deeper about these kinds of issues. And again, I would encourage you to, to think about how this plays out, not just in an, an example like this of race-based health disparities, which, which is huge, but go back to the example that I started with in terms of unemployment. Think about something smaller. Think about your own life. Think about some of the surface level tree problems that you continue to see show up in your own life. What's the trunk of that? What are the roots of that? If we were to take it deeper, if we were to think deeper, how do I sustainably address and prevent this? What would that look like? I will end with that. I could talk about this for a long time is probably your sensing. But again, this is a, a framework, a template that we can use to, to start 
attempting to address, understand, and take down some of those deeply rooted issues that we see in society today. So we can do something different and get a different result and get out of these patterns. Okay, have a great rest of your day.